proteins are just so pretty. Like I could get lost for hours in a good model. But, so what do I mean by model? Well, you know all these like pretty structure type things? The crazy part is they come from something like looking like this, at least for crystallography. And that electron density map, which I'll get into, it's actually coming from series of spots that looks like this and so you get that she's coming from a crystal that looks something like this that you shot with x-rays so you get this pattern of spots a little diffraction pattern and then you work backwards from that to get this electron density map which you can then use to put in the atomic model um and so when you see that pretty looking thing with all those ribbons and sheets and strands and all that stuff that's actually coming from this an originally really pretty thing which was the crystal um, but then this kind of a couple of intermediate weird looking confusing things um, with the help of some math which I'm not going to get into and thankfully a lot of automated software um, but I want to give you a better idea of how you can examine these maps and that sort of thing and see the various steps along the way and kind of get a better sense of what's involved with actually um, getting to that final model and that fact that it is a model. Before I have shown you um, Pymol, which is what these bottom windows are, this is on top um, Coot, which is another free software that we use a lot when we're doing uh, model refinement is really good for viewing maps um, and for doing like manual refinement where we're fixing the positions of various species and stuff and so um, without like the automated um, with less of the automated stuff um, but it integrates really well um, with other software like Phoenix and you can go back and forth between them as I'll talk about but that's just what these different softwares were so that you don't get confused this is all showing the same structure. This is 4F3T, and it's the structure of human argonaut 2 bound to microRNA20, um, solved in our lab by Lotto Kayam in 2012. Um, and so this is the same protein I studied, but I didn't do this crystal structure. But when I did my first crystal structures, I was so amazed at like actually being able to see an alpha helix. So see something like this. Um, see a... Um, See these like beta strands and these um, beta pleated sheets so yeah so this individual strands and then they can be in sheets but they're not always in sheets but um, so just keep that in mind so the sheets are the um, when you have multiple strands together and the strands are just like individual strands um, but I was just so amazed that you could actually like see these side chains and see all this stuff so if you have really good resolution um, so that's when the mesh will be like tighter around it and then you can make out the positions of side chains and stuff in positions where you have weaker resolution so you'll see there can be like breaks in the um, electron density where you can't see a various atom um, and so yeah it's just yeah so you can get like really just like spend hours because it's just so amazing to look at but all of these so what we're showing here this is a map of the electron density so with x-ray crystallography, that diffraction pattern, so that pattern of spots, it's coming um, because of wave interference. So x-rays are waves, um, just like all other forms of light. X-ray is just like a really energetic form of light. And what's going to happen is when those x-rays hit the um, atoms in the crystals, so remember those are the, like, the individual carbon, nitrogens, hydrogens, etc. They're actually going to interact with the electrons in those atoms. And so the electrons are the negatively charged particles that orbit around that central nucleus containing the protons and neutrons. So it's actually these electrons that are going to be interacting with these x-rays. And so you can think of it kind of like each x-ray that hits an atom is kind of like a golf ball dropping in water. And you know how you drop a ball in water and those ripples ripple out and then the ripples interact and some regions like build up, we call it constructive interference. Some build, um, cancel out, we call it destructive interference. And you end up with this sort of like mega wave um, that is has contributions from all of the atoms that were, um, that acted to form that wave. Um, with crystallography, because the atoms, because you have that crystal structure, 
So you have that orderly lattice, remember? Where you have all these different copies. So the same thing is happening in all these places. And what that happens is that this ends up working out so that you get a discrete pattern of spots because the waves are going to cancel each other out everywhere except for these plate where it fulfills like Bragg's this thing called Bragg's law um, so too complicated to go into here but basically it's not actually like this but it works out mathematically that we can think of a crystal as being um, made up of these series of lots of series of um, families of parallel planes so we can pretend to slice a crystal with equally spaced virtual planes and then the x-rays would be like bouncing off from those planes as if they were mirrors so this isn't real but it is really helpful um, so the planes represent places where Bragg's law this thing called Bragg's law is satisfied which means that the waves are going to interact constructively give you a stronger beam and then that beam is going to be um, detected um, by in this um, by our detector as a spot and then we work backwards from these spots to get to the information about what was inside of the crystal what was in between those planes that was contributing to the signal so because each of those spots has contributions from like all of the different atoms in the crystal then we need if we have the information from all of these spots we can, using some complicated math and a thing called a Fourier transform, work backwards from those spots to actually figure out the positions of all of the atoms that were contributing to the signal. So the idea with the Fourier transform is that you can take a super complicated wave um, and you can represent it with um, a lot of smaller, simpler waves. Um, so if we think of electron density, um, we have this like electron density function or whatever. So the distribution of all the electrons in that crystal as like a big wave. And then each of these spots we can think of as kind of the contributions from a single wave within it. Um, and so, but for the waves, you can think of a wave as having like um, a couple important properties. So one is the amplitude. So that's like how tall the wave is. But then another is the phase. So like where in relationship to, is like the peak versus the drop or whatever to whatever. So if that didn't make very much sense, but think if you're at, like if you're this ruler and this wave is moving through, at some part it's going to hit you at the bottom, some place is gonna be hit you at the top. And because you have these different waves, they can be in different phases. So this is easiest to see like when the phases are like exactly the same then you get complete constructive interference when they're slightly different then you can get destructive interference um and so destructive interference can be partial or complete and the reason why we get um an extra crystallography we get this um discrete pattern of spots is because of those um the Bragg planes the equally spaced nature of the crystals means that they're going to cancel each other out everywhere except for those specific locations that fulfill that thing called Bragg's Law, um, which I'm not getting into here. Um, but that's where the conditions are just right for diffraction. Um, but basically, so you have this idea that you have this, a wave can be described using by its amplitude and by its phase. When we measure these diffraction patterns, the information from each of these spots has a value we can we call the structure factor and it has information about describing like that wave and remember a wave has a phase and an amplitude um, and so the intensity correspond is related to the the amplitude so we can directly get the amplitude from the darkness of the spot but we don't have the phase information. And so one of the um, tasks of a crystallography is to figure out that phase information so that we can actually calculate that electron density map. Because we need, we're going from the spots, we do that Fourier transform to get that electron density map. And so remember the electron density map is this thing like this, 
without showing um, this. So it's this um, this meshy thing. And so we need to figure in order to get a map like this, we actually need to figure out those phases. And so we there's different methods you can use to like initially kind of guess the phases um, to get the initial phases. So there are things like molecular replacement where you can take a similar um, protein. So maybe it's um, you have a related protein, a really similar related protein. You want about like at least 40% or so identity. Um, and or maybe it's the protein without being bound to something or well being bound to something, but basically something um, that would be similar. Um, and then you can calculate what the um, like what the phases would be for that protein um, and that data um, and then use that to make your map. So there's like experimental methods where you can do things like grow it with selenium instead of sulfur so that the sulfur um, so that your protein has like um, selenium incorporated and then that can give a different signal in those spots and it kind of like helps you anchor things or you could do like heavy metal soaks, similar things. Um, but basically these are all different ways that you can get initial phases. And when you get those initial phases then you can start to build a model. So that's, you can actually put in the atomic positions of the various atoms. When you do, when you put in the positions of the atoms, then you can start going back and forth between what we call like real and real space. So like what like actually these atoms and like reciprocal space which is like the diffraction pattern and so when you go you go from real space to reciprocal space using a Fourier transform when you have a model you can then calculate use the Fourier transform to then calculate the um, what the like electron what those sorry what the um, phases and the intensity should be um, and then you can say okay well how well does my model correspond to what I actually observed and then what you do is you work back and forth between the model and um, the like initial data to try to make a model that best fits the data without overfitting it so often what you'll do is you'll leave out part of the data um, and then you'll work with the other part of the data and then apply the values determined by your model to um, see how well they match that data that you left out. Um, and so that helps you make sure you're not overfitting your data so you're not like building into noise because if you have, like so say you were trying to make a model to describe, to, um, represent what hap like the noises in your house in a, on a typical afternoon and like one afternoon there happens to be a dog barking and so you make your model so that there's a dog barking but there's not usually a dog barking and so now you've like overfit your model and it's not going to work well for uh, representing other days when there's not that dog barking so basically there's like various things with the solvent being different um, like the water molecules order differently in different parts of the protein or that sort of thing and you don't want to be building into that noise so you often see things like R work and R free. So R free is like the, um, the from the data that you left out or whatever. So it's basically just ways to make sure you're not overfitting the data. Um, so what we're showing here. So this is a um, this is showing just this is the um, two FO minus FC. So two times the observed minus the calculated. We can also show. Um, just the FO minus FC, so observed minus calculated, and this helps show where there's regions that um, may be something missing in the model, or there's something that, um, so that you, the model needs to have, like, maybe a side chain should be going a different direction, or that sort of thing, or there's d data that is not in the model that should, um, that's data in the model that shouldn't be in the model based on the experimental data. Um, and so right now it's showing, um, we put it typically at like a high um, level of meshiness, so a high, um, um, so that you can really see the features. But it's important also to know that the, num the, the positive and the negative are going to have to equal out to zero. So you're always going to see like um, 
green and red things. So don't like think, eh, there's green and red things. Um, but basically, the you want the thing to keep in mind is that you're always going back and forth um, between when you're doing like your model building and refinement, trying to work out um, to make the model and the data um, agree as best as possible. But the tricky thing with crystallography is because you have you don't have those phase information, so you're actually like refining the phases as you go, so the map can actually like get better when you're like working because remember you only have those intensities and you're trying to figure out the phases and so when you're working in like even like when you're working in real space so you're like fixing the the side chains and that sort of thing so that they fit the density better um, and then you can when you improve then you go back and you calculate okay now what would the model what should the um, model be um, or what should like the density factors and all those things be um, and then you can improve the phases that way um, and making sure that you also have that data that you left out so you make sure you're not overfitting. So it's this really iterative process, um, but the basic thing is that like it's a lot of work, um, but the structure that you see at the end is based on this um, experimental evidence. So you have that pattern of spots and then you work backwards from that spot to get the electron density map. Um, and then you build in the structure for that. Um, and then you can display it in these various ways. Um, and so there's, if you go to like the PDB, you can, um, there's, you can get information on like statistics and stuff for how well the data matched the model and how um, strong the data was to begin with. Um, if you want to actually like look at the map, so right now this is in Coot, um, if you go to like file, fetch PDB um, and map, then if you um, put in this, it'll actually like download the maps as well as just the um, just the structural model. So with like um, Pymol, if you just do like fetch, it's just gonna download the structural model. But if you do um, get PDB, um, then you can download the maps as well. Um, and you can also, like, there's different commands you can do, so you don't have to just do it from the GUI, but, um, but that's how you can then see this. So if you do, just a quick, um, note, so let me just reinitialize, okay. So if I were to go and I were to get PDB, so if I do 4F3T, so this is the 2FO, FC map, so that's um, good for helping. Um, this is the map that you normally see, and it helps like um, minimize the bias from your model. When, so you're seeing it's um, two times the observed minus the calculated. Um, when you do FO minus FC, it's the observed minus the calculated, and so it's good for seeing regions that um, the map in the model um, disagree with, or so maybe there's additional things that could be changed. Um, so when you download it, okay, so first you might think, okay, well, it's just showing me the, the structural model again. Um, if you then turn on, so if you go to like action mesh, and so now you can put on the mesh, um, and then if you like scroll sideways or forward or whatever, you can then adjust the um, like the plane that you're looking at because it can get kind of overwhelming. Um, so usually instead of showing the ribbon because then it's hard to see things, um, or sorry, so showing the cartoon, it's hard to see things, um, you can show like the ribbon, so you know I need to hide the cartoon, or you can show um, the sticks and or various things.